That's my prayer is that God's will will be done. Um, thanks for coming today, and uh, thanks for being in small groups. We had um, 89 on campus in small groups. We had 83 who were ministered to off campus, so we're very grateful for that. Uh, small groups are coming up. I mean, it's uh, Sunday school. We're going to be talking about um, in the days that are ahead. The new church here is going to be coming soon. So be, uh, be praying about how you can participate and help. Uh, pray some, God's going to do some, some good things, some, uh, some new classes. That's what we're, we're uh, praying for and, and expecting. Uh, if you have your Bible, open to Acts chapter number 2. Starting our summer series, which will really only be the month of July, uh, we're going to be talking about vision. Vision. When I came to New Holland, uh, I prayed, as I always do, about the direction that the Lord would have me to preach. And the very first thing that came to my mind was, um, or as I continue to pray, was faith. Because we want to be God-pleasers. We want to be people who have faith that is just a normal aspect of our life, that we just see things the way God sees things. And we can trust that God will be God and he will be big. And we will not be controlled by our circumstances, but we will be filled with all the things that God has for us. Now that is the normal Christian life. I think I said this at the beginning of our series on faith. It's a quote by Vance Havner. And the quote that Vance Havner said is, we as Christians have become so subnormal that when you see a Christian that's normal, you think they're abnormal. And that's pretty true. There is so much that God has for us that we have just kind of taken for granted or that, that we just think, well, that's for somebody else, but it's not for me. And I want us to understand that God loves all of us that God has a plan for all of us. And God wants to magnify, the Father wants to magnify the Son through the Holy Spirit in us. He wants our lives to be all about Him. We are a trophy of His grace. And, and we can possibly see it in others, but do we ever see it in ourselves? And I just want you to, as we take the next four weeks to talk about vision, vision. I want you to understand that, that God wants you to see your life, your family, your work, your play, uh, the things that you do in your life. He wants you to see them the way he sees them. He wants you to know that he has a plan for each and every area of your life, and he wants you to see it. And it's not vision is sometimes overcome by memory. And please hear me when I say this, before we ever get started. Some people only do what they have seen done and what they've been taught to do. Now, we all do that. I mean, we were, we're with our children, we teach them uh, the ABCs and those songs and Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. How many of you remember the B-I-B-L-E? Yes, that's the book for me. Amen? I, I was a RA when I was a kid. How many of you remember the Royal Ambassadors? Uh, as a Royal Ambassador, I will do my best to become a well-informed, responsible follower of Christ, to have a Christ-like concern for all people, to learn how the message of Christ is carried around the world, and to keep myself clean and healthy in mind and body. Can you believe I still remember that after all these years? It's good to teach foundational truths. But how many times have you seen people say, well, I, I, this is just what we do. This is what we've always done. This is what mom did. This is what grandmother did. There's nothing wrong with having a foundation. But please understand this. That grows to a point, and God has so much more for you. So much, so much, so much more. And it really doesn't matter your station in life. It doesn't matter how young you are. Those little kids up here that are just learning, they're going back in the back and, and, and they're going to learn those things of God and we're going to reinforce those things. I pray for Lance. He's a, God, a man of God and, and he's leading our, our teen kids 
and we're going to do everything that we can to support him. There's some people here who need to step up in ministry there because truly that's what we're going to do. We're going to grab a hold of the older generation. We're going to grab a hold of the younger generation, and we're going to get God to bless them both. Amen? We're going to grow a church the size of God. We're going to love the people God loves. We're going to minister to the ones that God brings before us. And I want God's people to catch that. I want them to feel the enthusiasm or the, the motivation that comes from the Spirit of God as we seek to honor Christ in every area of our life. So in the next four weeks, we're going to be talking about vision. But I pray it's simply to learn so that we can see God the rest of our days. We can be aware of the movement of God. Because as Henry Blackaby did once again 30 years ago when he came out with that foundational teaching, experiencing God, what we're supposed to do is see where God is at work, and instead of asking him to come join us, we're supposed to come join him. So in your workplace, join him as he works at your workplace. In your family, join him as he builds and constructs your family. Your finances need to have one thing leading them and guiding them, the whole God, holy God of the universe. The things that Satan places before us, listen, to lead us astray, to, to distract us. God will put a heavenly vision before us that will energize us for the journey and the days that are ahead. Now, I have preached Acts 2 many, many times. But there's one passage, one particular part, that as I get to Acts 2, I, I, I glance over. Can y'all forgive me for that? As a matter of fact, I, I, I thought, you know, I've never really heard a sermon on this particular part, the quotation from Joel chapter 2. And I looked and I, I study believe it or not, and, and I, I want to hear what it is that God's Word says because I want to be a Bible-preaching preacher, right? So there's, there's great people of faith that have written commentaries and stuff like that, and I wanted to hear what it is they had to say about this passage, and, and it really didn't matter who I read. They would, they would spend a lot of time on the first part of Acts chapter 2, and if you're interested in the first part of Acts chapter 2, I'm going to go over it quickly, but I'm going to go into it in depth tonight. So that's the commercial for 6 o'clock tonight. <laughs> Amen. So if I go by it and you say, he didn't mention anything about that, well, you come tonight and I'll mention a whole lot about that, right? But, but everyone that I got to it, they just glossed over it and went on. And, and to be honest, I would have loved to have used other scriptures, but I've got my four scriptures for the four weeks, and this is the one that I had to be faithful to today. So um, instead of your standing while I read all the scripture to you, let me just pray over this, and let's just look at it in a good old-fashioned Bible study, and let's just look at it verse by verse. Y'all good with that? Say amen. amen. Let's pray. Father, help us see Jesus. You are alive and well, so let us see your movement. Let us see your heart. Let us see what you're doing in our lives. Let us, we know that you have plans for us. Let us see them. And Father, open our eyes, our hearts, our thoughts, our motives. And Lord, anything that is not conformed to the image of the Father, for the glory of Christ, through the leading of the Holy Spirit, may we change it. Lord, let it begin today. Give us eyes of Christ. Lord, when we get to heaven one day, we will see and we will know that that plumb line of truth that Amos talked about that we, we know is there, but Lord, we'll realize the power of it then. But Lord, help us see truth today. And Father, we are so much creatures of habit. And what we think 
and what we want. And Lord, we are, are often controlled by our emotions and how we experience things. And Lord, I thank you for the gift of those things. But Lord, I pray that they be honoring you. So Lord, you came in and changed everything at Pentecost. And we are grateful. So Lord, let us see the truths today. In your name I pray. Amen. Acts chapter 2. Well, if I turn over my Bible. Acts chapter 2. Verse number 1, the Bible says that when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. The all is the, those 120 who had been there 10 days earlier when Jesus raised his hands and the law of gravity was suspended and he ascended back to glory. I, I'll preach that sermon one day. It's one of my favorites my heart just gets raptured just thinking of it, that the Lord of glory who took off those robes of glory and laid them down and came down to Bethlehem to be born into this world so that he could be our salvation, so that he could walk the, the sinless life, so that he could give his life at Calvary, so that he could come back and, and take that life back so that we could have new life, so that he could be resurrected once again. He is alive, church. He is well. He knows you. He loves you. He knows every thought in your heart. He knows every cell in your being. He is there to help every heartbeat, to take every breath until the day that he knows that your time here on earth is over. God is God lovingly watching and caring and providing his goodness for us. Amen. Praise God. Amen. What a God we have. Wonder, wonderful God we serve. But ten days later, after he ascended and went back to glory, he told them, he said, uh, stay. Go, stay together. And they did. They probably just uh, hop, skipped, and jumped down the hill where they saw Jesus ascend, went back to that place, fell on their knees, and for 10 days they had communion together with God by the power of His Spirit. On Passover, the Jewish holiday, that's when Christ was killed, where they crucified Him on the tree. On the Feast of Firstfruits, that's Resurrection Day, when Christ was resurrected from the grave. That's uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 20. Jesus was raised as the first fruit. But the next holiday in the Jewish calendar, Leviticus 23 tells us the Jewish calendar, the next holiday was the holiday of Pentecost. It was 50. That's what the word Pentecost means, is 50. And it's 50 days after the Feast of First Fruits. Now, Pentecost, or excuse me, Passover, or death. First Fruits, that's the Sabbath. That's uh, the Lord's Resurrection Day. That is on a Saturday. Seven weeks and one day later, is Pentecost. Now, Jesus was resurrected and he came forward from the grave for us. Now, 50 days later, the Jews celebrated Passover, or excuse me, Pentecost. They celebrated Pentecost as the giving of the law to the Jews. That was huge for them. They were people of the law. Now, church, listen to me. I'm going to try to make this as plain as I can without making it all cluttered up. The Jewish people were very much about the law given by Moses. Before that, everyone did what was right in his own eyes. They had judges who would rule. But then when the law came, the law was to show us our sin. The point of the law, no one could ever fulfill the, all the law. Anybody in here never sinned? I put my hand. I didn't either. We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. What the law was to do was to show you your sin so you could go to God 
and repent of your sins and have a relationship with the Holy God. That was the purpose of the law. But in the Jewish religion, it became the end. You were born a Jew. You could become a proselyte and become a Jew. But there really wasn't much, can I use the word evangelism of the Jews? They just were who they were. They were very much about, this is who I am, and this is what I do. And they judged everybody by who you were, what tribe you were from, and what you did in your life. Were you a good Jew by how you lived the law? And some were very proud. The Pharisees, the scribes, the Herodians, the attorneys, they were very much proud of what they were. The Sadducees, they had their own sect. They disagreed with the Pharisees, but they were very proud of who they were and what they did. All the arguments that came up were simply about the interpretation of Scripture. If you ask someone if they were a Jew, they would say very much, yes, I was Jew, I was born a Jew. Or I became a Jew at a certain time. Very much about who they were and what they did. And it sounds very much like many Christians today. If you ask the question, are you a Christian? In the United States of America today, 90% will still tell you. Yes, they're a Christian. They actually, some people, link Christianity with being an American citizen. Well, of course, all of America. We are a land under God. We have it on our money, one nation under God. We, we, we have the, the week of the fourth when our, our country has its birthday. We, we think of all of the heritage we have, and we very much say that we're Christian. And people in the church are very much about saying, this is who I am. This is who my parents were. This is who my grandparents were. It's almost as if it's tradition. And it's, it's, it's about what we do. Are you a good Christian by what you do? I don't, you know, uh, what is the old song Brother brought us? Uh, they used to make a joke about it. I think it was uh, Lowry that wrote this one. If you got hair on your ears, you got sin in your heart. <laughs> I, I remember when I grew up, we used to go to revivals all the time, and the preachers were always against it. They always wanted to tell you your sins. I didn't need any help. I knew what my sins were. But they had a list, and it was almost like if you could check off their list, you were good. There may be other things in your life where you may be a scoundrel, but as long as you, you went by their list, you were okay. As a matter of fact, we do that in just about every area of our life. Here's the problem with what Judaism had become. Stale, dead, legalistic. Legalist, legalistic. Boy, it took me three times to get that word out. <laughs> I don't even like saying that word, evidently. <laughs> legalistic. And you almost prove how good a Christian you are by all your do's and don'ts. God help us. In the view in heaven, he knew that we were sinners, and he sent one to make a way. Not to be legalistic, but to be full of grace and full of mercy. And what about us who were not born Jew, God's chosen people? What about us? Would we have had a possibility to come to know God? Would we have had to, to, to go to Judaism and men? Would we have had to be circumcised to be a good Jew? Would we have had to, to follow all the laws, all the rituals, so that we would please God? Or will we simply accept salvation by grace through faith? Pentecost shows us an example. Look what it says here. I'm going to go quickly. Suddenly there came a, verse 2, a sound from heaven, as of a rushing, 
mighty wind. This is the gift of the Holy Spirit. They didn't see it, but they heard it. And it filled the whole house where they were sitting. God's gift of the Spirit, where once the Spirit would come in the Old Testament to certain individuals, but now it's coming upon all. Verse 3, there appeared to them divided tongues. We'll talk more about that tonight. The word tongues, diakitos, where we get a word dialect. Language is what it means. And they appeared to them divided languages as of fire, set on fire, and one sat upon each of them. Fire speaking of, of, the, of the power of God, the manifestation of God, that would not just to come in to add to, but to take over. God didn't bring the Holy Spirit to just be icing on the cake. He came to be the all in all Christian. He doesn't come just to add to you. He comes to take over. There is no area of your life that does not need to be controlled by the Holy Spirit. There is no area of your, of your life where you do not have to have Christ manifested and glorified. Everything in our life should honor him. Everything. There is no division of mine and his. That was handled at Calvary. It was handled when I gave my heart and life to him. I became his. He became mine. Praise God, that's salvation. But yet, many describe Christianity by the acts of going to church or what we might tithing. Or I believe in small groups, so I, I go to Sunday school. Listen, every area, your thoughts, all your thoughts, your desires need to be baptized by the Holy Spirit. Your motives. You need to have a holiness Upon every area, if God doesn't amen it, you don't need to be doing it. And, and allow, allow him. Look, we're all different. Amen? God gave us all different personalities, all different interests. That's good. That's great. But he comes to magnify himself in the uniqueness of who you are. Brother Mark, in the choir, you've got sopranos, you've got altos, you've got baritones, tenors, basses. Praise God for the difference, but how the harmony of what we can do together. God doesn't want to create clones. He doesn't want to create puppets. He wants to take his spirit, place it upon all of us, and turn us into the most wonderful instrument of his glorious, glorious grace. Verse 4, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. They dwelled in Jerusalem, Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when the sound occurred, the multitude came together and were confused because everyone heard them speak in his own language, his own dialect, his own tongue. Then they were all amazed and marveled and saying to one another, look, are not all these who speak Galileans? How is it that we hear each in our own language in which we were born? Parthians, Medes, uh, Elamites, those who dwell in Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of uh, Libya, adjoining Cyrene, visitors from Rome, and Jews, and proselytes, Christians, and Arabs. We hear them speaking in our own tongues the wonderful works of God. So they were all amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, whatever could this mean? Others said, they're full of new wine. They're drunk. Now, on a holiday, which is what this was, this was Pentecost, you were not even allowed to drink before 9 o'clock in the morning. I, I couldn't imagine anybody wanting to drink at 9 o'clock in the morning. But Verse 14, but Peter, standing up with the eleven, raised his voice and said to them, men of Judea, and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and heed my words. For these are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what, which, which, excuse me, but this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. This is uh, Joel chapter 2, verses 28 through 32, a direct quote from Scripture. And it shall come to pass in the last days. Now, every, every prophecy, which is what this is, in Old Testament, 
is going to have a two-fold uh, explanation. There will be a short-term part of the prophecy and a long-term part of the prophecy. And you knew the truth of the long-term prophecy, listen to me now, by seeing the short-term part of the prophecy fulfilled. So when you saw the short-term, then you could add to it and say, long-term, this is coming. And this is speaking, Joel chapter 2 is speaking of last days. But even as we understand it, from Calvary forward, from Resurrection Day forward, is last days. Now, on Pentecost, the church was formed. And it's been a couple millennium. And Christ is coming back. And when Christ comes back, there will be a, a tribulation that will begin. And then Christ will come and, and change all that, and there will be something known as the millennium reign. I'll, I'll be more than happy to share that. That's not this morning. Amen. But here is a short-term prophecy of that which would be poured out early on, and then there's the long-term prophecy, the end of it, that which would come at the very end. So it says, And it shall come to pass in the last days, I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh. Now listen to me, church. Anybody. Anybody. In the Old Testament, God chose, and there was a certain one, but it wasn't available to all. Now, the plan of salvation was formed before the, before the beginning of the, the creation of the world. God knew the plan of salvation. And Christ, amen that, before Genesis 1-1. And now, the cross has been fulfilled. And now, he is available. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. Right? Right? So here he is saying it's available to all, but only to those who so choose. So he says, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Now, here's the message. Y'all ready? Everything else has been the introduction. I thought when Sheila was talking about forever and she was looking for examples, I was expecting one of the kids to say, the preacher sermons. <laughs> your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. The word prophesy means to speak forth the truth by divine, hmm, by divine utterance. To speak forth the truth by divine inspiration. The Jews didn't do that. They went around and they taught, but they never shared the story. Now, listen to the church. I'm going to quit hitting my pocket. They're not sharing the gospel here. They're sharing the goodness of God. When the Holy Spirit came upon them, they went everywhere sharing the glories, the goodness, the, the wonder of who Christ was. Is there anybody in this room that knows Jesus Christ as their personal Savior and Lord that can't be overflowed with the goodness of God? and just can't have a, a good time of bragging on Jesus everywhere you go. We're so worried about being a witness. Can I just say, if we could just get set free to just let Christ be amplified in our life, if we could just get used to just sharing with people the name of Jesus, telling others how much we love Jesus, what Christ has done for us. That's the ministry that he wanted. The Jews didn't do that. All they did was talk about the law. What we have been set free by God to do is to be a proclaimer of the goodness of Christ. Are you in love? Oh, that was an amen moment you just let pass by. You're going to talk about what you're in love with. You love baseball, you're going to talk about baseball. You love old cars, you're going to talk about old cars. Right? You love your wife, you're going to talk about your wife. I love my wife. You love your grandkids, 
you'll have 72 pictures on your, in your pocketbook. <laughs> Men, we can do it now too because we got a phone. We can sit here and do this. Look at here. You're going to talk about what you're in love with. But the world has told us that we can't talk about Jesus. The world has told us that it's offensive to talk about Jesus. But hear this. He poured out His Spirit on us. And when the Spirit fills us, it overflows. Christ comes out. He says, your men and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Visions. Broadus and I talked about this week when we went shopping. Yes, that's right. Broadus and I went shopping. <laughs> with the golden agers. He loved his wife, and he went to eat. Amen? And he sat down and talked to a policeman about the Lord on the front. They, they, they build those benches up there for you. Now, they know what happens. They're, those are the men's benches, right, while the lady shop. We talked about vision this week. I remember the first time I, I went to New York City and walked the streets of Manhattan. And I was looking for the Empire State Building because I've, how many of y'all seen King Kong? So I, I, I wanted to see the Empire State Building. So we walked by the Empire State Building, and I was two blocks away from that thing because I had no clue it was a whole city block. I was just looking at the stores down there, right? And I said, where is this thing? And I turned around, and I looked up. And I, I tell you, we, got in, I, we went to the top of that. My wife's got a picture on her dresser of, of me on top of the inside, an Empire State Building. Who in the world would dream that up? Who in the world would have a vision to say, let's build this thing 100 stories tall? We'll have elevators that'll get you up. If I built that elevator system, it'd take you a week to get up to the top. <laughs> and it doesn't make you sick, and it's just, they have a vision for that. Matter of fact, you go to just about any major city now, and you can, you know what I mean when I say you see the skyline? And the things that people are doing, they're talking about now these cars that are battery operated that will drive themselves. I'm not too sure about that. I hadn't got that part of the vision yet. Amen? Unless my daughter's driving. Then I might need some, no. She's with us this morning. She got a ticket this week. But it wasn't for speeding this time. Look, vision is to be able to see that which is not there, come on now, and be a part of making it real, making it come alive. It says the young men shall see vision. Praise God for the young that have passion. Praise God for the young who can see beyond what is there to what could be. We need that. Once again, the enemy of vision is memory. We can only build what we always have had. We're just looking for repeating what we have had. Look, Mayberry's not coming back. You might like Mayberry. You might like Andy, and you might like Aunt B, and that's fine. That's good. It's not coming back. Neither is happy days. Amen? Praise God, neither is Dallas <laughs> and days of our lives. i never seen so many people resurrected. You see them afternoon soap operas, they died five times and they came back. And they're coming back again, I don't know. Vision of what could be. Then it says, and the old men shall dream dreams. Dreams are uh, emotions that have not yet been dealt with. Unresolved emotions. God gave us all emotions. 
Emotions are how we deal with the things of life. Sadness, happiness, anger, grief. Those are emotions. Frustration. Now here's the thing though. Emotions are how we interpret life and, and it's, it goes to the part of the brain, uh, the, the frontal cortex. But there's this part of the brain where it's called the amygdala. And, and I call it like the filing cabinet. So it, it, when, when, when anything happens to you, it goes to the amygdala, and it goes to the area of the brain that it needs to be a part of. Now, sometimes emotions don't get dealt with. Have you ever had a, something that you did one day? And you dreamed about it all night? I know you have, right? And, and sometimes there's things that happen in your life that, that you, you've never dealt with and they're going to come back to you. Sometimes there are dreams. One of the reoccurring dreams that I have in my life is uh, lack of, it comes from the root of lack of preparation or a fear of not being prepared to do something. So all the things, I, I, I was so worried about it because they all, my dreams had the same theme about it. I went and studied it and wanted to, wanted to know more about it. Those unresolved emotions keep coming back. Some happen from wounds as children, and people don't deal with those things, so there's a theme that happens in their dreams. Now, many times God would come speak to his people in dreams. Many times, please listen to me now, there would be desires that God would put in people's hearts that they never got fulfilled and, and they continued to live them in their dreams because they were unresolved. It's unique that he says the young men will have vision, but the old men see things that, that are not the way they're supposed to be and it bothers them. Things that, that are in their families, things in their personal life, things in their country, things in the world, and they're unresolved, and they dream about them, and they want them to be right. And if we said a person had dreams, it's because they have something that they would like to see solved in this world. Things like Martin Luther King when he said the word, I have a dream. He was looking for, for a, a, a place and time in America that would not be defined by race. Amen to that. We're all God's children. When I was a child, red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in His sight. I was raised by parents who would not allow me to think prejudice. And I, I praise God for that. I praise God for that. But Martin Luther King said, I have a dream. He had a desire because he saw the unrest and he wanted something better. The young men have a vision for what can be. The old men have a dream. But all had the spirit of wanting to share the goodness of God. He goes on to talk about things that would happen in the last days at the end of the, the age before Christ comes. But this was the short term that would happen there. As a matter of fact, Peter got up and said, hey, this is real. And he goes on to preach Jesus. Oh, they didn't like it. They didn't, well, 3,000 got saved that day, but they didn't, the, the, oh, there's some that didn't believe and they didn't like it and they told them they had to be quiet. They couldn't preach that way. But listen, they they came to, to persecute Peter and John, and he said, we cannot help but speak the things that we have seen and heard. That's what the Holy Spirit will do in our life. Did you hear me that, church? We cannot help but speak the things that we have seen and heard. We're so worried about teaching people to be a witness. We just need to fill them with Christ and let the Holy Spirit be in charge and turn them loose and all the areas, think of all the different places that we as a church are going to go today. Think of all the tentacles of love that we can minister to today. But it begins with a vision of God. An understanding of the goodness of God. 
of what he's done for us and what he knows he can do for others. I wonder, I wonder. I told the church last Sunday that my favorite kind of music is jazz. I guess that was Sunday night. Was that Sunday night? And uh, it is. And I, I, I learned music when I was young. And y'all know how you have to learn, you know, whole notes and half notes and quarter notes and eighth notes. And you, you, you put those things together. And I remember I was learning to play an instrument. And I was trying to keep it in time. And I just wanted it to be just right. And then... Believe it or not, I got a little better, and I could, I could play better, and, and we sounded good when we played together, and then I found that, I don't know, I, it's just who I am, I guess, but I wanted to add my own flavor to it, and when I got invited to be part of the jazz band, hello, I found my home, because they would just set me free. Now, there were parameters, right? Because you're, you're, not all, you're not a single person on your own. There was parameters. And, and I don't like all jazz, but I like it when they can come and express themselves. And it's not just the, you know what I'm saying? And I wish we could kind of get a little bit of a spirit of that in, in the church where it's not just rules, 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 do it, do it, do it, do it. But we could understand that we can... God wants to pick you up like an instrument and play in you. And you could express the individuality of who you are and the story that you tell. Nobody else has got a testimony like you. Vision is seeing things the way God sees things. Vision is letting God pour himself through you. So let me just ask this one Simple question. Are you willing to make yourself available for God to pour himself through you in every circumstance, in every place? Are you allowing your, him to pick you up like an instrument and play through you? Heads bowed. Lord, I thank you. For the church, I thank you for the opportunity of the church. I thank you that we are part of the church because of who we are in Christ. Lord, that we could bow our heads and confess our sins because we all have them. And we could, we could ask you to save us. This last passage from Joel 2 says, And those who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I'm grateful for salvation that's full and free. Lord, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful that I don't have to be good enough. I can just receive what you have done for me. But Lord, take us and use us. We do so much because we always have, but I pray that we can see you with fresh eyes, hear you with open ears, and Lord, a heart that wants to honor you and serve you and love you. Lord, the blessings of the great resources you've put in this church, the talent of your people. Lord, may we always seek to speak forth the truth with divine inspiration. Prophesy for you. Lord, may some have a vision of what could be. And Lord, may we see this world in all of its ugliness, but Lord, have a dream of what you could do. Lord, resolve those things. And once again, oh Lord, I pray, let it begin in me. Let it begin in this place. Lord, we belong to you. You died for us. May we serve. Lord, may we serve you with no hesitations. Father, that's enough. We would be honored if you would do so. So, Lord, speak to your people. They love you. They want to do your will. 
There's no doubt about that. They're here because of that. Lord, let them know today that you have a plan for them, a purpose. Lord, I pray that uh, they would be open to what it is that you have for them. Give them something fresh, the freshness of your Holy Spirit. Pour in them, fill them up, and Lord, may they share it, splash on everybody around them, the glories of Christ. Father, I pray that today all has been for your honor and glory. Use this invitation however you see fit. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. <laughs>